Welcome to a half hour of Mind Webs. Short stories from the worlds of speculative fiction. This time the story comes from the book The Farthest Reaches, edited by Joseph Elder. The story is Robert Silverberg's To the Dark Star. We came to the Dark Star, the microcephalon and the adapted girl and I, and our struggle began. A poorly assorted lot we were to begin with. The microcephalon hailed from Quendar 4, where they grow their people with greasy gray skins, looming shoulders and virtually no heads at all. He, it, was wholly alien, at least. The girl was not, and so I hated her. She came from a world in the Procyon system where the air was more or less Earth-type, but the gravity was double ours. There were other differences, too. She was thick through the shoulders, thick through the waist, a block of flesh. The genetic surgeons had begun with human raw material, but they had transformed it into something nearly as alien as the microcephalon. Nearly. We were a scientific team, so they said, sent out to observe the last moments of a dying star. A great interstellar effort. Picked three specialists at random, put them in a ship, hurled them halfway across the universe to observe what man had never observed before. A fine idea. Noble. Inspiring. We knew our subject well. We were ideal. But we felt no urge to cooperate because we, well, we hated one another. The adapted girl, Miranda, was at the controls the day that the dark star actually came into sight. She spent hours studying it before she deigned to let us know that we were at our destination. And then she buzzed us out of our quarters. I entered the scanning room. Miranda's muscular bulk overflowed the glossy chair before the main screen. The microcephalon stood beside her, a squat figure on a tripod-like arrangement of bony legs. The great shoulders hunched and virtually concealed the tiny cupola of the head. There was no real reason why an organism's brain had to be in its skull and not safely tucked away in the thorax, but, well, I had never grown accustomed to the sight of the creature. I fear I have little tolerance for aliens. Look, Miranda said, and the screen glowed. The dark star hung in dead center at a distance of perhaps eight light days, as close as we dared to come. It was not quite dead and not quite dark. I stared in awe. It was a huge thing, some four solar masses, the imposing remnant of a gigantic star. On the screen, there glowed what looked like an enormous lava field. Islands of ash and slag the size of worlds drifted in a sea of molten and glowing magma. A dull red illumination burnished the screen. Black against crimson, the ruined star still throbbed with ancient power. In the depths of that monstrous slag heap, compressed nuclei groaned and gasped. Once the radiance of this star had lit a solar system, but I did not dare think of the billions of years that had passed since then, nor of the possible civilizations that had hailed the source of all light and warmth before the catastrophe. Miranda said, I've picked up the thermals already. The surface temperature averages about 900 degrees. There's no chance of the landing. I scowled at her. What good is the average temperature? Get a specific. One of those islands... The ash masses are radiating at 250 degrees. The interstices go from 1,000 degrees on up. Everything works out to a mean of 900 degrees. And you'd melt in an instant if you went down there. You're welcome to go, brother, with my blessing. I didn't say you implied that there'd be a safe place to land in that fireball. Miranda snapped. Her voice was a basso boom. There was plenty of resonant space in that vast chest of hers. You snidely cast doubt on my ability to... We'll use the crawler to make our inspection, said the microcephalon in its reasonable way. There never was any plan to make a physical landing on the star. Miranda subsided. I stared in awe at the sight that filled our screen. A star takes a long time to die and the relic I viewed impressed me with its colossal age. It had blazed for billions of years until the hydrogen that was its fuel had at last been exhausted and its thermonuclear furnace started to sputter and go on. A star has defenses against growing cold, 
As its fuel supply dwindles, it begins to contract, raising its density and converting gravitational potential energy into thermal energy. It takes on new life. Now a white dwarf with a density of tons per cubic inch, it burns in a stable way until at last it grows dark. We've studied white dwarfs for centuries. We know their secrets, so we think. A cup of matter from a white dwarf now orbits the observatory on Pluto for our further illumination. But the star of our screen was different. What we beheld now was the core left behind by the supernova explosion. Even after that awesome fury, what was intact was of great mass. The shattered hulk had been cooling for eons, cooling toward the final death. For a small star, that death would be the simple death of coldness, the ultimate burnout, the black dwarf drifting through the void like a hideous mound of ash, lightless without warmth. But this, our stellar core, was still beyond the Chandrasekhar limit. A special death was reserved for it, a weird and improbable death. And that was why we had come to watch it perish, the microcephalon and the adapted girl and I. I parked our small vessel in an orbit that gave the dark star plenty of room. Miranda busied herself with her measurements and computations. The microcephalon had more abstruse things to do. The work was well divided. We each had our chores. The expense of sending the ship so great a distance had necessarily limited the size of the expedition. Three of us, a representative of the basic human stock, a representative of the adapted colonists, a representative of the race of microcephalons, the Quindar people, the only other intelligent beings in the known universe. Three dedicated scientists and therefore three who would live in serene harmony during the course of the work. Since, as everyone knows, scientists have no emotions and think only of their professional mysteries. As everyone knows, when did that myth start to circulate anyway? I said to Miranda, where are the figures for radial oscillation? And she replied, see my report, it'll be published early next year, and damn you, are you doing that deliberately? I need those figures now. Give me your totals on the mass density curve, then. They aren't ready. All I've got is raw data. That's a lie. The computer's been running for days. I've seen it. She boomed at me. Well, I was ready to leap at her throat. It would have been a mighty battle. Her 300-pound body was not trained for personal combat as mine was, but, well, she had all the advantages of strength and size. Could I club her in some vital place before she broke me in half? I weighed the options. Then the microcephalon appeared and made peace once more with a few feather-soft words. Only the alien among us seemed to conform at all to the stereotype of that emotionless abstraction, the scientist. It was not true, of course. For all we could tell, the microcephalon seethed with jealousies and lusts and angers, but we had no clue to their outward manifestation. Its voice was as flat as a vocoder transmission. The creature moved peacefully among us, the mediator between Miranda and me. I despised it for its mask of tranquility. I suspected, too, that the microcephalon loathed the two of us for our willingness to vent our emotions and took a sadistic pleasure from asserting superiority by calming us. We returned to our research. We still had some time before the last collapse of the dark star. It had cooled nearly to death now, there was still some thermonuclear activity within that bizarre core, enough to keep the star too warm for an actual landing. It was radiating primarily in the optical band of the spectrum, and by stellar standards, its temperature was nil. But for us, it would be like prowling the heart of a live volcano. Finding the star had been a chore. Its luminosity was so low that it could not be detected optically at a greater distance than a light month or so. It had been spotted by a satellite-borne X-ray telescope that had detected the emanations of the degenerate neutron gas of the core. Now we gathered around and performed our functions of measurement. We recorded things such as neutron drip and electron capture. We computed the time remaining before the final collapse. And where necessary, we collaborated. Most of the time, we went our separate ways. The tension aboard ship was nasty. 
Miranda went out of her way to provoke me. And though I like to think that I was beyond and above her beastliness, I have to confess that I matched her obstruction for obstruction. Our alien companion never made any overt attempt to annoy us, but indirect aggression can be maddening in close quarters, and the microcephalon's benign indifference to us was as potent a force for dissonance as Miranda's outright shrewishness or my own deliberately mulish responses. The star hung in our view screen, bubbling with vitality that belied its dying state. The islands of slag, thousands of miles in diameter, broke free and drifted at random on the sea of inner flame. Now and then spouting eruptions of striped particles came heaving out of the core. Our figures showed that the final collapse was drawing near, and that meant that an awkward choice was upon us. Someone was going to have to monitor the last moments of the dark star. The risks were high. It could be fatal. None of us mentioned that ultimate responsibility. We moved toward the climax of our work. Miranda continued to annoy me in every way, surely for the devilishness of it. Oh, how I hated her. We had begun this voyage coolly, with nothing dividing us but professional jealousy. But the months of proximity had turned our quarrel into a personal feud. The mere sight of her maddened me, and I'm sure she reacted the same way. She devoted her energies to an immature attempt to trouble me. Lately, she took to walking around the ship in the nude, I suspect trying to stir some spark of sexual feeling in me that she could douse with a blunt, mocking refusal. Uh, the trouble was that I could feel no desire whatever for a grotesque, adapted creature like Miranda, a mound of muscle and bone twice my size. The sight of her massive udders and monumental buttocks stirred nothing in me but disgust. The witch. Was it desire she was trying to kindle by exposing herself that way, or, or loathing? Either way, she had me. She must have known that. In our third month in orbit around the dark star, the microcephalon announced, The coordinates show an approach to the Schwarzschild radius. It's time to send our vehicle to the surface of the star. Which one of us rides a monitor? I asked. Miranda's beefy hand shot out at me, and she said, You do. I think you are better equipped to make the observations, I told her sweetly. Thank you, no. We must draw lots, said the microcephalon. That'd be unfair, Miranda said, and she glared at me. He'll do something to rig the odds. I couldn't trust him. How else can we choose? asked the alien. Oh, we can vote, I suggested, and I nominated Miranda. I nominate him, she snapped. The microcephalon put his ropey tentacles across the tiny nodule of skull between his shoulders and said... Since I did not choose to nominate myself, it falls to me to make a deciding choice between the two of you. Uh, I refuse the responsibility. Another method must be found. We let the matter drop for the moment. We still had a few more days before the critical time was at hand. With all my heart, I wished Miranda into the monitor capsule. It would mean at best her death, at worst a sober muting of her abrasive personality if she were the one who sat in vicariously on the throes of the dark star. I was willing to stop at nothing to give her that remarkable and demolishing experience. What was going to happen to our star may sound strange to a layman, but the theory had been outlined by Einstein and Schwarzschild a thousand years ago, and had been confirmed many times, though never until our expedition had it been observed at close range. When matter reaches a sufficiently high density, it can force the local curvature of space to close around itself, forming a pocket isolated from the rest of the universe. A collapsing supernova core creates just such a Schwarzschild singularity. After it's cooled to near zero temperature, a core of the proper Chandrasekhar mass undergoes a violent collapse to zero volume, simultaneously attaining an infinite density. In a way, it swallows itself and vanishes from this universe, for how could the fabric of the continuum tolerate a point of infinite density and zero volume? Such collapses are rare, 
Most stars come to a state of cold equilibrium and remain there. We were on the threshold of a singularity, and we were in a position to put an observer vehicle right on the surface of the cold star, sending back an exact description of the events up until the final moment when the collapsing core would break through the walls of the universe and disappear. Someone had to ride gain on the equipment, however, which meant, in effect, vicariously participating in the death of the star. And we had learned in other cases that it becomes difficult for the monitor to distinguish between reality and effect. He accepts the sensory percepts from the distant pickup as his own experience, and a kind of psychic backlash results often an unwary brain is burned out completely. What impact would the direct experience of being crushed out of existence in a singularity have on a monitoring observer? I was eager to find out, but not with myself as the sacrificial victim. I cast about for some way to get Miranda into that capsule, and she, of course, was doing the same for me. It was she who made the first move by attempting to drug me into compliance. What drug she used, I have no idea. Her people are fond of the non-addictive hallucinogens, which help them break the monotony of their stark, oversized world. Somehow, Miranda interfered with the programming of my food supply, and she introduced one of her pet alkaloids. I began to feel the effects about an hour after I had eaten. I walked to the screen to study the surging mass of the dark star, much changed from its appearance of only a few months before. And as I looked, the image on the screen began to swirl and melt, and tongues of flame did an eerie dance along the horizons of the star. I clung to the rail, sweat broke from my pores. Was the ship liquefying? The floor heaved and buckled under me. I looked at the back of my hand and saw continents of ash set in the grouting of fiery magma. Miranda stood behind me. Come with me to the capsule, she murmured. The monitor's ready for launching now. You'll find it wonderful to see the last moments. Lurching after her, I padded through the strangely altered ship. Miranda's adapted form was even more alien than usual. Her musculature rippled and flowed. Her golden hair held all the colors of the spectrum. Her flesh was oddly puckered and cratered, with wiry filaments emerging from the skin. I felt quite calm about entering the capsule. She slid back the hatch, revealing the gleaming console of the panel within, and I started to enter. And then, suddenly, the hallucination deepened, and I saw in the darkness of the capsule a devil beyond all imagination. I dropped to the floor and lay there twitching. Miranda seized me. To her, I was no more than a doll. She lifted me, began to thrust me into the capsule. Perspiration soaked me. Reality returned. I slipped from her grasp and wriggled away, rolling toward the bulkhead. Like a beast of primordial forests, she came ponderously after me. No, I said. No, I won't go. And she halted, her face twisted in anger, and she turned away from me in defeat. I lay panting and quivering until my mind was purged of phantoms. It had been close. It was my turn a short while later. Fight force with force, I told myself. I couldn't risk any more of Miranda's treachery. Time was running short. From our surgical kit, I took a hypnoprobe used for anesthesia. I rigged it in series with one of Miranda's telescope antennae. and programming it for induction of docility, I left it go to work on her. When she made her observations, the hypnoprobe would purr its siren song of sinister coaxing, and perhaps Miranda would bend to my wishes. It didn't work. I watched her going to her telescopes. I saw her broad-beamed form settling in place. In my mind, I heard the hypnoprobe's gentle whisper as I knew it must sound to Miranda. It was telling her to relax, to obey. The capsule. Get into the capsule. You will monitor the crawler. You, you, Miranda, you will do it. 
I waited for her to rise and move like a sleepwalker to the waiting capsule. Her tawny body was motionless. Muscles rippled beneath that obscenely bare flesh. The probe had her. Yes, yes, it was getting to her. No. She clawed at the telescope as though it were a steel-tipped wasp drilling for her brain. The barrel recoiled, and she pushed herself away from it, whirling around. Her eyes glowed with rage. Her enormous body reared up before me. She seemed half berserk. The probe had had some effect on her. I could see her dizzied strides and knew that she was awry. But it had not been potent enough. Something within that adapted brain of hers gave her the strength to fight off the murky shroud of hypnotism. You did that, she roared. You gimmicked the telescope, didn't you? I don't know what you mean, Miranda. Liar, fraud, sneak. Now, calm down. You're rocking us out of orbit. I'll rock all I want. What was that thing that had its fingers in my brain? You put it there. What was it? The hypnoprobe you used? Yes, I admitted coolly. And what was it you put into my food? Which hallucinogen? It didn't work. Neither did my hypnoprobe. Miranda, someone's got to get into that capsule. In a few hours, we'll be at the critical point. We don't dare come back without the essential observations. Make the sacrifice. For you? For science. I said, appealing to that noble abstraction. I got the horse laugh I deserved. And then Miranda strode toward me. She had recovered her coordination in full now, and it seemed as though she were planning to thrust me into the capsule by main force. Her ponderous arms enfolded me. The stink of her thickened hide made me wretch. I felt ribs creaking within me. I hammered at her body, searching for the pressure points that would drop her in a felled heap. We punished each other cruelly, grunting back and forth across the cabin. It was a fierce contest of skill against mass. She would not fall, and I would not crush. The toneless buzz of the microcephalon said, Release each other. The collapsing star is nearing its Schwarzschild radius, and we must act now. Miranda's arm slipped away from me. I stepped back, glowering at her to suck breath into my battered body. Livid bruises were appearing on her skin. We had come to a mutual awareness of mutual strength, but the capsule still was empty. Hatred hovered like a globe of ball lightning between us. A gray, greasy alien creature stood to one side. I would not care to guess which of us had the idea first, Miranda or I. But we moved swiftly. The microcephalon scarcely murmured a word of protest as we hustled it down the passage and into the room that held the capsule. Miranda was smiling. I felt relief. She held the alien tight while I opened the hatch, and then she thrust it through. We dogged the hatch together. Launch the crawler, she said. I nodded and went to the controls. Like a dart from a blowgun, the crawler housing was expelled from our ship and journeyed under high acceleration to the surface of the dark star. It contained a compact vehicle with sturdy, jointed legs, controlled by remote pickup from the observation capsule aboard ship. As the observer moved arms and feet within the control harnesses, servo relays actuated the hydraulic pistons in the crawler eight light days away. It moved in parallel response, clambering over the slag heaps of a solar surface that no organic life could endure. The microcephalon operated the crawler with skill. We watched through the shielded video pickups getting a close-range view of that inferno. Even a cold sun is more terrifyingly hot than any planet of man. The signals coming from the star altered with each moment as the full force of the red shift gripped the fading light. Something unutterably strange was taking place down there, and the mind of our microcephalon was rooted to the scene. Tidal gravitational forces lashed the star. The crawler was lifted, heaved, compressed, subjected to strains that slowly ripped it apart. The alien witnessed it all, and dictated an account of what he saw, slowly and methodically, without a flicker of fear. 
The singularity approached. The tidal forces aspired toward infinity. A microcephalon sounded bewildered at last as it attempted to describe the topological phenomena that no eye had seen before. Infinite density, zero volume. How did the mind comprehend it? The crawler was contorted into an inconceivable shape, and yet its sensors obstinately continued to relay data, filtered through the mind of the microcephalon and into our computer banks. Then came silence. Our screens went dead. The unthinkable had at last occurred, and the dark star had passed within the radius of singularity. It had collapsed into oblivion, taking with it the crawler. To the alien in the observation capsule aboard our ship, it was as though he too had vanished into that pocket of hyperspace that passed all understanding. I looked toward the heavens. The dark star was gone. Our detectors picked up the outpouring of energy that marked its annihilation. We were buffeted briefly on the wave of force that ripped outward from the place where the star had been. And then, all was calm. Miranda and I exchanged glances. Let the microcephalon out, I said. She opened the hatch. The alien sat quite calmly at the control console. It did not speak. Miranda assisted it from the capsule. Its eyes were expressionless but they had never shown anything anyway. We are on our way back to the worlds of our galaxy now. The mission has been accomplished. We have relayed priceless and unique data. The microcephalon has not spoken since we removed it from the capsule. I do not believe it will speak again. Miranda and I perform our chores in harmony now. The hostility is gone. We're partners in crime, edgy with guilt that we do not admit to one another. We tend our shipmate with loving care. Someone had to make the observations, after all. There were no volunteers. The situation called for force, or the deadlock would never have been broken. But Miranda and I hated each other, you say. Why, then, should we cooperate? We are both humans. Miranda and I. The microcephalon is not. In the end, that made the difference. In the last analysis, Miranda and I decided that we humans must stick together. There are ties that bind. We speed onward toward civilization. She smiles at me. I do not find her hateful now. The microcephalon is silent. Listening to a story from the farthest reaches, edited by Joseph Elder. The story was by Robert Silverberg and called To the Dark Star. This is Michael Hansen speaking. Technical production for Mindwebs by Steve Gordon. Mindwebs is a production of WHA Radio in Madison, a service of University of Wisconsin Extension. <laughs>